Hi, my name is Dr Catherine Hughes from Crime Psych. I'm a criminal psychologist and I run a business that enables me to bring knowledge and learning to everyone, not just those who are at universities or colleges, and I do this by producing a range of blogs, vlogs and free online courses. I also run some slightly more in-depth courses, both online and face-to-face. -face. You don't need any previous qualifications to learn with me and there are several available. So once you've finished watching this video, head on over to my website and see if you can make it to an event or learn online in your own time. This particular video is looking at escalation and de-escalation in violent offending. It can be a common understanding for violent serial crimis, criminals to escalate the behaviour. We've seen it time and time again. In some of the psychological analysis videos that I've done, I've spoken about the escalation in the amount and level of violence used. It's, it is important to note that I am only talking about violent serial offenders, not all offenders. Although it has been found that juveniles are more likely than adults to exhibit escalation of seriousness in their offending careers. Two researchers who conducted a recent study found that Canadian juveniles indicated offending with minor delinquency during adolescence and then escalated to more serious property and violent crimes in their mid to late teens. The ways in which violence escalates over time are dependent on a number of variables. It wouldn't be possible to accurately say that all violent serial offenders will escalate their behaviour over time. It's not a simple relationship. It can be different for each person. The age of onset of offending, life circumstances, changes in job or outcome are just a few examples of why it isn't as simple as it first appears. In general offending behaviour, there's mixed evidence on escalation. Several researchers have found patterns of escalation in young people at the beginning of their criminal career and then a de-escalation over time. However, there's been little evidence of de-escalation in the general adult criminal population. There is some evidence that suggests that general offenders will show some de-escalation in adult offenders over time. Family environment, substance abuse, age and race have all been found to be related to escalation. It's been found that black offenders were more likely to escalate to more serious crimes, particularly to robbery from a property offence than white offenders. White offenders that did escalate their offending were most likely to transition to substance related or property offences from less serious miscellaneous offences. There is evidence in general offending that juveniles escalate their offending. Factors such as poor academic performance, antisocial behaviour, beliefs favouring deviance and negative family environments were associated with escalation, while academic success and positive social skills are associated with de-escalation. In studies on young offenders, it has been established that age can be associated with de-escalation, whilst increased exposure and experience to the criminal justice system was associated with escalation. Young offenders will typically begin with general minor deviancy and status offences and eventually escalate to more serious criminal behaviour such as drug use and alcohol use associated with thefts. A Canadian study found that juvenile offenders that began with offences such as shoplifting or vandalism around the age of 11 to 14 went on to carry out crimes such as burglary, theft or motor vehicle theft around the ages of 14 to 17. They then escalated to more serious crime types such as armed robbery, drug trafficking or sex crimes between the ages of 16 and 19. One study looking at serial rapists who escalate their use of blunt force found that rapists who were white rather than of a minority status and who, at the time of their first reported rape, raped their victims for longer periods of time and used more profanity are more likely to escalate in their level of blunt force than rapists who don't exhibit those behaviours. All criminals have a point at which they have never committed a crime. It would be very unusual to come across a person who's used excessive force on a victim for that to be their first offence. Those who murder 
are very likely to have committed some type of a crime before their first murder. A person doesn't just wake up one morning and think to themselves, oh, I think I'll go out and kill somebody today. There are the expectations of society that they have to deal with, such as the acceptance that we don't just walk into somebody's home without being invited, or taking gardening equipment without the owner's permission. Therefore, it, it is likely that a person would start with knowing that they shouldn't hit others or to not hurt animals. Once they've hit a few people or harmed a few animals, the internal forces that stop us from doing things that we know we shouldn't do have begun to be weakened. I'll give you an example from my life. When my younger son would come shopping with me, I used to open packets of sweets or drinks on, in the supermarket and give them to him on the way around. I think that most mums have probably done this, but then scanned and paid for the items at checkout. But my son took it a few steps further. He'd become comfortable with eating things in the store without paying for them first. Then, eventually, he went on to take a Kinder Egg off the shelf by the checkout while I was distracted and would sit underneath the counter to eat it while I packed. Obviously, I didn't know that at the time and he only found this out a few years ago and he's 17 now. He technically committed theft, which he now knows and would have known at the time is wrong. But the first step to that was become uncomfortable eating items in the supermarket without paying for them. In the psychological analysis videos that I've done on serial killers, most of them had been peeping toms in their teens. John Duffy, the railway rapist, and his friend David Mulcahy started by chasing girls around the schoolyard and scaring them. That, of course, led on to rape and ultimately murder in their adult life. Many serial killers started out, as I said, by peeping into windows. They found that the intrusion of privacy was exciting to them. Dr Scott Bond has previously said that peeping through windows is a violation of privacy and that lends itself well to issues of power and control for the offenders. Watching through a window leads to crossing the boundaries of that property. Many rapists have convictions for burglary first. Even if no one's home, it's still exerting power and control and taking something from the victim, even if that's just taking away their choice to privacy. Contact with a victim would be the next stage in this series of events to overcome any feelings of wrongdoing or guilt. This contact could be any level of violent interaction. It could involve robbery or general aggressive behaviour, such as getting into fights with strangers. Then there would be the intended crime carried out on victims, such as rape or murder. Dennis Rader, known as the BTK killer, had often watched women for long periods of time. When he was stationed in Ger Germany, he'd break into houses and steal women's underwear, Peeping at them through windows can be a method to overcome wrongdoing, but it's also incredibly important for the offender to make sure that they can get away with it when they do go on to offend. Serial killers will often spend time looking for the right time and place to, to offend, as well as identifying any potential victims. So we see this escalation in the offending behaviour of serial killers and how they psychologically prepare to offend. However, in many cases, we see an escalation in the amount and level of violence used on the victims. Research has shown that arsonists who are diagnosed as pyromaniacs and shoplifters who are diagnosed with kleptomania trigger the release of extra dopamine, which causes feelings of pleasure. With all types of offending, it's impossible to apply general rules across the whole offending population. For example, when somebody sets multiple fires, it's not they're not automatically diagnosed as a pyromaniac. They may have set the fires to get rid of evidence, for example, or as a form of revenge. But with violent behaviours, it gives offenders the feeling of having power and control over their victim. Each time they're violent, their body releases dopamine and the offender feels a high. As with any type of addictive behaviour, the body gets used to those levels of dopamine and it won't be enough to feel that same high with the same level of violence. 
Therefore, the violent behaviour comes more aggressive and more frequent each time to get that same high feeling. De-escalation is much less common, but it can still happen. Numerous factors could influence an offender to stop. They may move or they may not have access to their preferred type of victim. They might not have the opportunity to offend because of a change in family circumstances, for example. They may even find a different outlet for their emotions. For example, Dennis Rader murdered 10 people between 1974 and 1991. However, he didn't carry out any more murders until he was arrested in 2005. He told investigators that he engaged in autoerotic activities as a substitute. He'd set up a tripod and camera and photographed himself in various forms of bondage. Some involved Raider limiting his own oxygen su supply to experience a heightened feeling of euphoria during sexual release. Many serial killers murder as a form of stress relief. Therefore, if that stress is removed and they no longer feel a need to look for an outlet for their emotions, they will stop offending. For example, the Green River Killer murdered several prostitutes during his first two difficult marriages, but he married a third time more happily and the killings dwindled down in numbers. It could even be something as unexciting as the offender gets bored with their activity. I used to be an Irish dancer because I really enjoyed dancing and competing. But don't do it now because I just lost interest in it over time. To a serial killer, murder can be viewed as, as benignly as other day-to-day -day activities or hobbies. I do hope that you've enjoyed this video on escalation and de-escalation with serial violent offenders. More importantly, I hope that you've learned something new. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.